Well, hey, nice to meet you. My name is Kendall Roden, and this is Alice Gibbons. Uh, we both work at Diagrid and have been involved in the Dapper project pretty much since, since it uh, started back in 2019. And who has ever actually played with Dapper outside of the context of today's conference? Okay, so a few. Uh, for some of you, who, who is this like an entirely new concept, never really heard of the project? Awesome. Perfect. Well, you're in the right place. We love talking about it, and you're going to have to shove, shove us off the stage in 24 minutes because uh, we always like to jam a lot of content into less time than we have. So we'll go ahead and kick it off. Alice, if you want to go ahead and just move us over. So uh, yeah, this is something I just wanted to bring up. We'll pause here. How many of you at some point or another uh, in the past, I don't know, one to, to three years have had conversations internally about different kinds of hosting platforms, Kubernetes, should we go CAS, should we go FAS? How many of you have had that? Yeah, probably all of you, right? Debates over which hosting platform to use, which cloud provider to use, how abstracted you want the infrastructure um, that your applications are running on top of. But uh, you know, what's typically missing from this conversa conversation is probably also what's kind of missing uh, from this conference, which is application developers. Can we, can we agree? <laughs> Yeah, people, yes, okay. <laughs> Clearly it's a popular topic because all of this, you know, all of you showed up here today. So ultimately, really there's a gap in the conversation, right? We've made code a lot more modular in the sense that we can, you know, put it into a container, run it on Kubernetes, get consistency across cloud platforms and Kubernetes providers. But ultimately that doesn't actually make your application code portable. Uh, so if you're using a variety of, variety of different cloud hosted services like uh, you're running on, you know on AWS you want to use s3 for storage uh, when we bring in all of those libraries and SDKs to communicate to these specific services we're actually locking ourselves in at the application layer right so containerizing that doesn't actually solve the application portability problem you know outside of the DevOps space um, so what we really need to focus on and what we see a trend towards in this industry and within you know the application development space is creating a you know an API layer through which developers can consume consume infrastructure services and communicate to other applications, right? So that focus more on application portability and creating, you know, an, an area through which platform engineers can create and, and produce infrastructure that can easily be consumed um, in an abstracted way by developers without losing productivity. So that's essentially what Dapper was created to solve, right? Providing this unified programming model through which developers can consume underlying infrastructure and communicate to, to other microservices or applications running on top of you know, the hosting platform of, of your choice. Uh, so it's really that consistent unified set of APIs that you can use to develop distributed applications or cloud native applications. Uh, and we'll dive into a little bit more about what that looks like in practice in this next slide. Okay, so we saw this earlier. How many of you were here earlier for the test containers, like Mauricio's talk? Okay, perfect. So you probably recognize this slide. Just gonna do a quick kind of overview of the core Dapper architecture. So it really starts with any code, any framework, right? Earlier today, if you were in the session, we talked about Java, Spring Boot, um, but really Dapper can be you know, accessible from applications in any frameworks written against you know, any coding languages. And, then, and that's really where the, the polyglot support comes in. And then basically through a set of HTTP or gRPC APIs, you can access a set of building blocks. And these building blocks are really just common, common patterns used to build uh, distributed applications, right? We need, we just talked about like choreography, orchestration, saga patterns. A lot of that comes into play here, right? How do I do distributed communication across services? How do I get tracing and observability out of the box and implement resiliency policies? How can I make sure I directly invoke other services in a secure way using MTLS. Uh, so a lot of these capabilities provided out of the box um, through these Dapper best best practice building blocks. And then last but not least, really focused on portability at the infrastructure layer. Ultimately, Dapper, you know, 90% of users today in production run Dapper on top of Kubernetes. Um, however, you can run this, you know, on your local machine. You can run this, you know, on a set of VMs. Uh, so it isn't necessarily just you know, isolated to Kubernetes. All right, awesome. So what does this look like in practice? The other slide is very theoretical, but when we actually look at the APIs, they run on top of Kubernetes as a sidecar, essentially. So you have your application code, you'll inject the sidecar uh, you know, into the same pod as your application, and then you'll essentially access a, a series of APIs through that sidecar on localhost. 
So here we can see the set of standard APIs. So all of them are going to be communicating with that Dapper sidecar over localhost within the Kubernetes pod. And then you basically have a standard set of APIs you can invoke. So obviously a standard in the sense that they all follow a very standard pattern. Um, if we want to invoke another service, instead of calling that directly, I can use the invoke API. And the Dapper sidecar will facilitate forwarding that request using MDNS on your local machine or using you know, the DNS within your Kubernetes cluster. That's a kind of pluggable element there. Uh, there's also a state API. So if my application wants to you know, maintain its own state within a backing state store, instead of implementing the Redis SDK or talking directly to S3, I can instead call this generic uh, state API and the Dapper sidecar will facilitate that, uh, that connection to whatever backend broker I choose. So the same you know, goes so on and so forth with the, you know, the other set of APIs. And ultimately, today, we're going to focus on workflows. Uh, so we're going to be talking about the Dapper uh, Workflow SDK. We're going to be talking about the Dapper, Dapper Workflow API and the way that it can empower you in your development journey. So how does the API actually target these backend infrastructure resources? Uh, it uses the concept of Dapper components. So as I mentioned, right, I want to talk to Redis, but I don't want to use the Redis SDK because ultimately, what if I migrate to a different platform and want to use something on Azure like Cosmos DB or move to AWS and use DynamoDB? And maybe even locally, I want to use, you know, you know, something running in a container, right? I, I can actually just swap out the backend component. So that state API will point to any number of state components. And, and without changing my application code, I can just swap out that component manifest and point the API to a different infrastructure service. All right, who's ready to get into Dapper Workflow? Woo! <laughs> Yay, okay, awesome. So we're gonna dive in and we're gonna talk specifically about one of the newer APIs provided by Dapper as of Dapper 110. We're currently on the 112 release uh, called Dapper Workflows. All right, so I wanna go through, and I love, this is my, my animation fail. We got challenges early, so apologies in advance. Uh, but I just kind of want to go through like a traditional business process that all, can resonate with almost everyone. Um, pretty easy to, to imagine, right? Let's say I have an order process that I want to implement in a code first way. So I want to start my, you know, my process. And the first thing I'm going to do when someone submits an order is check inventory, right? Is this available in inventory? Can I fulfill this order? Uh, I'm going to need to coordinate some kind of transaction or some type, type of call to some type of database in order to retrieve the inventory and actually see if I can fulfill that order. So once we've determined if there's sufficient stock, if it's a no, the, the, the workflow is going to end, right? That process is over. We can't fulfill the order. Sorry, it's out of stock. Please try again later when we've restocked. And if it is sufficient, then I want to actually process payment. Uh, based on if I'm able to process payment successfully, either the workflow will fail, um, in which case we'll tell the user, I, you know, I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, you don't have enough money, you've been shopping too much, uh, or if the payment succeeds, we're going to go ahead and update that inventory. But before we do so, let's think, booked an airline flight, gotten through the whole process, and then been told that there's no more seats on the plane. Uh, so we know the whole, like, oh, that's because it's eventually consistent and yada, yada. Well, let's say in this case, right, we have to go back and check inventory because what we were selling was very popular, app developer con seats, and uh, by the time that you actually completed the order, there's no seats left, right? Uh, so we're going to go check inventory. If there's sufficient stock, we'll fulfill that order and complete the, the workflow. And then if there is no longer sufficient stock, we're going to refund them their payment, right? Because, hey, sorry, uh, you can't actually get in. It's too popular. So when we think about this process and modeling it in a code-first way, there's a ton of challenges developers are responsible for in order to coordinate this entire process, right? Uh, so what are some of those challenges? So we want reliability, right? We want consistency of our database transactions and our state management. We want to know that if the workflow is to fail, for example, if I go to process payment and I process it su successfully, but then can't ac access the database to update the, uh, the inventory, then obviously I want to be able to roll back. Uh, if for whatever reason the, the database isn't accessible, I don't want that workflow to just complete, right? It's not complete. I want it to be able to, to wait uh, until that state store or that database comes back online to resume that entire workflow and have the output that I'm expecting, right? So service coordination, right? What if my process payment uh, activity needs to happen in another microservice across the network, right? How do I actually make sure all of this happens within a single atomic transaction? And that's ultimately what the workflow API with Dapper allows you to do. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the core concepts within Dapper workflows. And these are pretty familiar primitives. How many of you have actually worked with some kind of like workflow editor, workflow engine at the code level? Okay, awesome. 
Um, and most likely, if you haven't, you've still implemented some kind of like transactional pattern in order to uh, try to achieve some of these capabilities, just maybe not in, in the way that's quite as concise uh, or out of the box. So within Dapper workflows, the biggest thing to consider is you're going to have a workflow object, but really the workflow itself doesn't perform any uh, you know, complex computation, any external API calls. All of that's going to be delegated to the smallest unit of work within the workflow, which is called an activity. Um, and this activity can be, you know, if we look back on that previous slide, which maybe else it's worth doing, these blue boxes will all be separate activities that within Dapper workflow can be orchestrated within the workflow context, right? Um, in a particular sequence, using whatever workflow pattern makes sense for whatever the workflow is you're writing, right? This can be fan in, fan out, monitor pattern, um, you know, a variety of different uh, workflow patterns all supported because this is very much, uh, you know, flexible and agnostic to whatever the type of workflow is that you're running. Additionally, durable timers. So Dapper workflows includes the concept of durable timers. So these can this could be like an arbitrary timeline or reminder up to a year long, right? So think about, hey, I have a process or, or maybe I have a, um, a trial, right? A product trial and I let someone in for 30 days and I want that workflow to actually proceed and close out the trial after 30 days. Um, the workflow itself will unload itself from memory while it's waiting for that event to fire or that reminder and then proceed, right? So for up to 30 days, for up to a year, these durable timers will allow you to run workflows that are flexible based on timeline. Additionally, you can create child workflows. So these would basically, within the context of a particular workflow, maybe within the context of an order workflow, you have another process, right, around procurement or, um, you know, shipment, right? You could actually start a child uh, workflow. And what this allows you to do is make sure that the, the workflow state um, and the number of tasks that are being executed isn't so long running that you basically, uh, you know, have too much in the state store. Uh, so the replay time uh, takes a lot longer, right? So that's just a best practice. And then last but not least, another really critical component is being able to wait on external events. So let's say that I'm in the middle, you know, I'm creating some kind of game simulation, right? I want to be able to wait for a particular event that a user takes um, in order to then formulate, you know, who's the winner of this particular trivia round, right? I need everyone's uh, answers to come in before I can announce a winner. I can wait for a particular event. That event can be fired off via an API call to the Dapper sidecar. And then ultimately, I can cl close out the workflow based on whatever the event was that was received. All right, awesome. So when we think about this from a technical perspective, there's a few things to consider. So like I said, Dapper want, runs as a sidecar process. Uh, if you're running locally on your machine, uh, it's just running as a process. If you're in Kubernetes, like I said, it's that sidecar. Uh, so your workflow is actually your code, right? You're completely responsible for authoring your workflow, um, and we provide a set of Dapper workflow SDKs. Uh, so right now, this is available in .NET, Python, and Java um, with more to come. But ultimately, whenever you fire up your application using that workflow SDK, it's going to make a call to the Dapper process and initiate an RPC stream. So essentially what's going to happen here is through gRPC streams, uh, the sidecar is going to be communicating to your application and managing the execution and sequence of the workflow within your application code. So the, the main thing to call out here is that your application defines the execution steps and the Dapper sidecar is really working on facilitating the management and the execution of those steps within your application code. And you can, yeah, you just, just click through, Al. Okay, so here we can see an example of what it would look like to actually kick off a workflow. So we'll make a, a single API request to start a workflow. Um, it'll generate a, an instance ID. Every workflow will have a unique instance ID that can be, you know, correlating to a particular order ID. It can be, you know, business centric or it can be, you know, arbitrary and random generated by the Dapper sidecar. And basically what that will do is the Dapper sidecar will then notify your application, hey, start this workflow, resume this, complete this based on a, a reminder, and it's handling all of the scheduling and the management. And the way it's doing this is because it, uh, it uses an event only, uh, excuse me, event stream, uh, a pinned only event stream, which is how it notifies your application as to what to do, right? Uh, so what's really nice is that when, you know, the workflow unloads itself from memory, it will replay itself whenever the workflow continues. Um, so this is optimal because it's resilient as well, right? If you go retry, it'll load up all of the ac activities that have already executed and then complete whenever, you know, with, with the await action essentially. So that's the way it works. So we'll, in this case, Alice will show you a demo where the workflow state is actually being maintained in Redis and that's where it's reloading and replenishing itself um, with every action that occurs. So. 
Thank you so much. That was a lot of content. Alice is going to get into the nitty gritty and code. Are you excited? You ready to see it? Okay, here we right. go. Awesome. Yeah, I think it was. Can you guys hear me? Yes? Okay. Um, yeah, so it wouldn't be App Developer Con without showing some code, right? That's what I hear. So we have to do that. But first, I just want to talk through a little bit how this works and sort of the mechanics of it. So as Kendall mentioned, right, we're going to be running the checkout workflow today. This is sitting within the checkout service. Um, and this is not the workflow engine because that's provided externally by Dapper. That's provided by the Dapper process or the Dapper sidecar in this case. So you can see on the slide here, I have the checkout workflow. And then what this is doing is it's uh, registering a number of activities. So you can see it has the notify activity, the check inventory activity, process payment, update inventory, and then refund. Um, and then the one that I'm really going to call out here is the process payment activity. Because typically, right, we would be calling an external service to process the payment. In this case, we're going to be calling out to an external HTTP endpoint that's non-dapperized. So it's, there's no, uh, it's just a square, the square payment service um, from the application. All right, let's see what that looks like. So if I jump into VS Code here, how's this on the very back? Can everyone see this? Is it big enough? Do I want to make it a bit bigger? OK, very cool. So this is a little bit. It's not. Oh. Like, does everyone want it bigger? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's going. All right, it's big. Um, OK, so this is a .NET application. As mentioned, the D Dapper SDKs for workflow are offered also in Java and Python. Um, but what we're going to start off with here is you see how we're going to be utilizing the Dapper Workflow SDK. So we're importing the Dapper Workflow SDK, and then we're calling out, we're, call, we're adding the add Dapper Workflow um, to my program file. And what this is going to do is I'm going to call it the checkout workflow, and then I'm going to register a number of activities that I want to be a part of this workflow. And these are all important because the activities are actually where that business logic is going to happen, right? Yeah, the workflow itself doesn't contain any of the logic. It just orchestrates the activities where that business logic lives. Um, from there, I can also, and then this is actually what's going to be kicking off um, that gRPC stream or initializing that gRPC stream from within my application. And it's going to reach out to that Dapper sidecar, that Dapper process, and then it's a bi-directional communication from there. So let's take a look at the checkout workflow. The checkout workflow, um, it has you know, an input and an output. All workflows in this case have to be deterministic. So if they have you know, the same input, we'll always produce the same output. Um, and I'm inputting a customer order. So I'm going to receive a customer order. In this case, we're ordering Dapper t-shirts, right? You know, we all have to, we all love Dapper t-shirts here. They sell out quickly, so you better go get yours at KubeCon. Um, and then we're returning a checkout result. And that is specifically whether something has been processed or whether it failed. Um, each of these activities can then be called out from within this orchestrator workflow, right? So we first have, we're calling this notify, notification activity. All this is really doing is printing a message. Not very exciting. Um, this next one here is checking the inventory. So this is the one that Kendall mentioned will check that database, right, to make sure that we have enough Dapper t-shirts that everyone wants. Um, I'm going to jump over to the, one of these activities now just to take a quick peek at what this looks like. You can see I'm also utilizing the Dapper client from within this code, and then I'm reaching out to the Redis state store in order to check that inventory. Now, one thing you'll notice about this code is there's no Redis SDK in here, okay? There's no, you don't see any mention of Redis. You don't see any... There's no SDK, right? All I'm using is the Dapper client in order to uh, reach out to that database and get the data back. Um, and then if I kind of, yeah, so this get state async, what it's going to do is it's going to reach out to that state store uh, and then return the value of, uh, of the, the amount of uh, t-shirts in this case. And I can also check to make sure that this is actually running because if you look at my... Um, state component. So this is, Kendall mentioned Dapper components before. So this is how we're actually talking to that Redis state store behind the scenes, right? We're using a YAML file in this case. We, we, love, we all love YAML here at KubeCon. And we're calling out to, in this case, my Redis is living on my local host. It's just a Dapper container. And it's calling out to that. And um, it's, yeah, saving and getting state from there. Heading back to the workflow itself, some of the other interesting activities here. Um, I'm going to do that payment process activity. So this one is the one that's going to be calling that external service. Um, again, I'm going to be reaching out to that square uh, external endpoint. And then I also, uh, because I'm using Dapper external ex service invocation here, I'm getting things like metrics, retries, um, as well as tracing built in. So jumping into the process payment activity, you can see, if I scroll down here, what this is, again, this is also using the Dapper client, but it's calling out to, again, this square payment service. 
Um, and this is just goes to show that like within this workflow, right, you have the opportunity to use a number of the different Dapper APIs available to you. Um, the, again, the activities are where all of that business logic is running and then keeping utilizing Dapper, it's completely uh, platform agnostic, but we're still um, accessing you know, a number of different services and a number of different infrastructure providers from within the code. Um, from in what's happening in the payment process service is I'm reaching out and I will either get a, it's, a ra it's randomized, and I'll either get the okay or the declined um, success or failure message from this Stripe or the Square APIs, and then it'll return and it'll uh, process the message back within to my workflow. Um, last but not least, the, yeah, the one thing I wanted to call out is that it was we can also put some compensating transactions within the workflow, right? So as Kendall mentioned, you know, say if you think about that business process workflow that we were showing before, imagine if you have, you know, an application that's running and you go and you, uh, you're placing your order and then by the time you place that order, the inventory doesn't exist anymore, we're going to have to have a compensating transaction that re refunds that person. So essentially what's happening in this case, um, we have to... Uh, issue a refund if that task if that task failed in fact in the previous um, in the previous call. So who wants to see this in action? <laughs> Woo! Okay, love that. Um, all right, I'm going to note. Twenty five minutes is very hard to put a lot of content <laughs> in. So I hope y'all are all keeping up. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to first kick off. Um, I'm going to start first start by running the application, and I'm using the Dapper uh, SDK or the Dapper CLI here. And so what I'm actually doing is I'm giving it a bunch of arguments. I'm giving it a application identity, a port, um, and then the port that the Dapper uh, sidecar or in this case process is running on. Um, I'm going to kick this off, and you're going to see a number of logs kind of showing up here. The most important ones, you'll see both the, uh, the sidecar logs as well as or the process logs as well as the, the application logs. And the things that I really want to watch out for is, hey, you know, you see that this sidecar uh, streaming connection has been established for when the app logs. That's that gRPC stream I was talking about. And then we also see that this workflow engine has started, again, provided for you by Dapper. From here, I'm going to kick off the... Um, the workflow. So I'm actually just running, this is just a uh, HTTP client plugin within VS Code. And what this is actually going to do is it's going to in instantiate a new workflow instance with uh, an, an ID. So each of these workflow IDs has to be unique, and they actually allow you to, you know, uh, model after business processes. So in this case, I can use like an order ID for my order. Um, but I'm going to kick this off, and you can see um, I'm making an order for Dapper t-shirts. My name's Alice, and I want 101 Dapper t-shirts. And what this is going to do is within this app code, um, it's going to receive, it's going to go through every one of those activities sequentially, right? So that first one, it's going to say, hey, I received that order uh, for, you know, 101 Dapper t-shirts. No luck. No such luck. There's only 100 Dapper t-shirts. So, you know, I, I guess that's it. That's it for the inventory. Then from there, the uh, workflow will itself get canceled because there is insufficient inventory available. So this is one of those paths in that business for workflow that I'm, I'm looking at. Oh, shit. Okay. Okay, yeah, okay. And then the other thing I can do is um, I'm just gonna order 10 of these, 10 of these t-shirts now, and we're actually gonna see it go through to completion here. So it's gonna go past the uh, inventory, it's gonna hit, it's found 100 different t-shirts here, and then it's gonna call out to Square to process that payment. Um, and then I, the last, uh, since we are closing on time, this actually failed the payment processes in this case, and it actually populated that error back up to the workflow itself. Um, the last one I want to do, though, is just do a request, and then I'm actually going to cancel the process. So what I just did there, right, is I ran through, the, I ran the application, I kicked off a workflow. You can see that two of those activities actually got started. Um, but then, say, you know, I'm, I'm running in Kubernetes and my pod died, or my application died. Let's pretend that happened. Um, and then I'm going to just rerun the application. I'm not going to re-kick off the workflow. Um, and you're going to see that workflow is actually going to pick up right where it left off. Uh, and what's actually happening here, so you can see it's, it's rerunning, it's found, you know, the t-shirts in inventory, and it's going to run to completion. And so what's actually happening here is the reminders, the reminders that are running uh, within Dapper, the Dapper workflow engine are actually, um, they keeps, it keeps track of every single activity that's been ran. And so since that activity did not run through to completion, the actor was not canceled, and it'll continue processing, uh, again, using partially that append-only log as well that Kendall mentioned earlier. Um, Okay, so we're out of time. Did y'all enjoy it? Did you at least enjoy it? Okay, if you want to learn more, 
come hang out with us. Yeah, there's a couple. So we'll send out, I'm pretty sure we'll send out these slides. So you'll definitely get access to them. Um, there's a lot of fun stuff to learn about Dapper Workflow. I uh, just wanted to call out, please give us feedback. If you can take a quick pic, that'd be great. We actually remember to put it in here. Um, if you say we talk too fast, just save it. We already know. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, yeah, join us. Con continue to get engaged with Dapper. Take a picture of this slide. That'd be awesome. And then basically, we did have one more thing. Please come see us at the Diagrid booth. Um, we are giving out these beautiful books that Mauricio has written. Um, if you give the password uh, Freedom from Fragmentation, you will be able to get one of those books for free. Um, so just keep that in mind. And then come talk to us. We just launched a product today. How about clapping for that? That takes Woo! a lot of work. Yeah, so if you want to come talk to us about that, please do. And then the last, last but very not least is if this was interesting, if anything on Dapper Workflows was interesting, we have a full session on Dapper Workflows on Thursday, November 9th at KubeCon. Um, so come to that one and learn a little bit more of what we teased here. Thank you. Woo!